Hi, welcome to The Bridge Podcasts. We hope you enjoy the following message. For more information on all that's happening at The Bridge Church, please visit www.bridge-church.com. You see, revival comes by a change of mind. We redig the wells because we change our mind. We, we, we make a decision to do something. I'm so pleased to see Alice here because the last time I saw Alice, she was in a hospital and uh, she was recovering, um, had a miraculous recovery. Uh, so it's so great to, to see her sitting there in the place where she should be. Amen. God's got a place for everybody and fill that place. Amen. So uh, God's been dealing with me about uh, revival and the issues of revival. And I believe that we are a church that are poised for revival. We're a church and a people that's poised for revival. But there has to come a change of mind. You see, that the first thing that happened in our, in our lives when we give our life to Jesus, He says that you be not conformed in Romans 12. Don't be conformed to this world or this world system, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If we don't renew our minds, nothing in your life is going to change. Uh, I'm not just talking about spiritually. I'm talking about physically. I'm talking about in the natural realm. Nothing is going to change because if we don't follow the principle of God's Word to see ourselves where, we, where God desires us to be, and we hook up with His desire for us and see ourselves where God wants us to be, then we'll stay in the same place. We'll, uh, <clears throat> we'll struggle in the, the, the morass of, of life. We'll walk about, as it were, with our feet stuck in the miry clay. We won't be able to walk properly. We won't be able to run. Uh, we'll just be trying to pull one leg up, move slowly through life. It's not what God wants for us. Amen. You know, God sent us with a message of redemption. He sent us with a message of liberation. He sent us with a message of faith, hope, and love so that people in this nation would be filled with hope, that they would have such hope for the future that nothing would get them down. Nothing would bring them into depression. Nothing would cause them to want to commit suicide or, 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 or live in the dark side of life. They would want to live up in a down world because their thought process was focused on God and focused on what lies ahead for us. I mean, how many of you are ready to receive a word this morning? I, I want to just thank God for His Holy Spirit because it's His Holy Spirit that brings us to a place where we can receive and apply the word, where we can receive. There's got to be a reception and there's got to be an application. There's got to be a reception of the Word, and there's got to be an application. There's got to come a time in your life where you receive and apply. Amen? That we, every one of us, are exactly where we have placed ourselves because of reception and application. You've either received the Word and applied it, or you haven't received it, or you've received it and you've misapplied it or done something, but we're the sum total of what we've said with our mouth and how we've acted in our lives. But God wants you to uh, thank God that His mercies are new every morning and great is His faithfulness. Thank God uh, we serve a God who gave us the principle of forgiveness. How oft shall I forgive my brother seven times? No, 70 times, seven in a day. And if God says, through Jesus, said 70 times seven in a day for the people that were here on earth, don't you think that's his characteristics? Don't you think that's the way God deals with us? That he would forgive us continually? Isn't it right? And he does until we say, no, I don't want any more of you, Lord, or I don't want anything to do with you, Lord. Then, then 
you move away from God, God doesn't move away from you. Isn't that right? You see, so if you've got friends that are moving away from God, tell them not to move away from God. Tell them to come back to God. Yes. Amen? Tell them to come back to God because God misses those people that used to, he, he, he sent His Son Jesus to save. He misses those people. They're all part of His forever family unless they say, I don't want to be part of your family anymore. There's people in this church struggling. There's people not here this morning struggling with their salvation, struggling in their minds with the thought processes of their minds. The enemy's taking advantage of them through the, uh, misplaced thought processes, and really there is, uh, there is a way that can all be corrected. Amen. Thank God that He gives us hope. Thank God that His Word brings correction. Yes. Amen. Brings us to that place of life in all its abundance. I thank God for the promises of God every day. I thank God I'm here because of Christ in me, the hope of glory. Uh, we do what we do because of Christ in us. My wife said, you see, God, God called us to do a job, you know, but he can, he can use the foolish things of the wise, uh, of the world to confound the wise. Isn't that right? If he could use Balaam's donkey, then he can use us. Isn't that right? If he can talk through a donkey, surely he can talk through us. Oh, you don't believe that. You haven't read your Bible. You don't know that Balaam's donkey spoke. <laughs> Help me, church. Help me. Help me this morning, please. If a, if a donkey can speak, well, we'd be able to speak because of God's blessing in our lives. Amen. So God can change us and He can change the world through us. Amen. All we have to do is be available. All we have to do is be disciplined to be available. Amen. And to do that, we have to be discipled to be dis disciplined to be available. Discipled to be disciplined to be available. Amen. So the message I've got, the, the, the Holy Spirit actually woke me up with this uh, at the beginning of the week. Let's read uh, Philippians this morning from uh, ch Philippians chapter 3 from verse 10. And uh, Katie, if we could just go right through uh, to verse 17 from the Amplified Bible. So in verse 10, and we're reading from the Amplified Bible, so I'll wait to, to it's up there so that you can see it with me. For my half-hearted purpose... For my determined purpose is that I may know him, who? Capital H, Jesus. That I may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly, perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly. You see, we, we, we will never come to the fullness of that understanding because God's beyond comprehension. Amen? He's beyond our understanding, but the Holy Spirit will give us a glimpse of that. Moses says, let me see your face. He says, no, you'll not see my face, but my goodness will pass before you. You see, so God shows us his goodness. Say goodness. God shows us his goodness. So there's some things that we just grow into and we grow, it becomes more clear in our life that I may in some way come to know the power outflowing from his resurrection. That is what we as Christians want to know. We want to know the power outflowing from his resurrection, which he which it exerts over believers. And that I may so share his sufferings and to be continually transformed in spirit into his likeness, even to his death, in the hope that if possible I may attain to the spiritual and moral resurrection that lifts me out 
from among the dead, even while in the body. When the, when the Bible's talking about the dead there, it's those that are dead in spirit, okay? okay? And those that are dead in the, 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 the lifeless as far as the spiritual uh, is concerned. Not that I have now attained this ideal. That's what Paul is saying. I haven't attained this yet. None of us I'd, uh, will ever attain. If you go to a church where the th- where the pastor thinks he's attained it, then you're in the wrong church uh, because no one will ever attain to that. And you can never attain to that level if that pastor says, follow me like I follow Christ, and he's got an, an unattainable level, you'll never get there. So you need to know that all pastors and ministers of the gospel can have failures in their life, there's some things that we all struggle with. Amen? There's things that we struggle with. Isn't that right? We're human. We struggle. But God's good. His mercies endure for our struggles. Isn't that right? Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, So, or have already been made perfect, but I press on to lay hold of, gra- and of, of and grasp and make my own that for which Christ Jesus the Messiah has laid hold of me and made me his own. Thank God Jesus grasped us and made us his own. I don't consider, brethren, and I have captured and made it my own yet, important word, yet, but one thing I do, But one thing I do, say, but one thing I do, it's my one aspiration, say, it's my one aspiration, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the supreme and heavenly prize to which God in Christ Jesus is calling us upward. So let those of us who are spiritually mature and full-grown have this mind, have this mind, and hold these convictions. And if any, in any respect you have a different attitude of mind, God will make that clear to you also. He's saying, I can fix out your attitudes. Parents, learn that scripture. Only let us hold true to what we have already attained and walk and order our lives by that. Brethren, together, follow my example and observe those who live after the pattern we have set for you. Amen. Thank God for His Word. I want us to focus in on, on, on the first verse. And uh, we're, we're, today... We're focusing in, and the message title is, But One Thing I Do. God has called every one of us for one thing. Amen? The person sitting beside you does not have the same gifts of you as you. This, this person sitting beside you doesn't have the same fingerprints as you, doesn't have the same eye recognition of you. That person beside you is completely different. You are completely unique in Christ. Amen. You are completely unique in Christ. Tell your neighbor, you're unique in Christ. Don't expect to be like me. Don't expect to be like anybody else because God made you completely unique. You're one of a kind. If it's your husband, say, I'm so glad I married you. Or if it's your wife, say, I know you're unique, baby. So, God has made us specifically that way. Uh, So, every one of us are called for one thing. and, And Paul says that I may know Him. This was one thing that Paul really wanted, that he may know Him. It was a simple plea of Paul's heart. Paul wanted more of Jesus, not more of self. Listen, it's, it's because we are so fixated on self today that we have so many young suicides. That young suicides from 2011 to 2014 have increased by the latest statistics 116%. Isn't that terrible? 
Why? Because people are fixated on themselves. Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I think I'll go and eat worms. Well, not everybody hates you. It may be one or two people round about you haven't the sense and they don't understand your uniqueness, but you've got to think about your uniqueness and not their preferences. Are you with me? Uh, because otherwise you go into a depression and you think nobody likes me. No, that is a perception. The world's got seven billion people. I'm sure if you look hard enough, somebody will like you. Your mom likes you. Your dad likes you. I love you. Amen. <laughs> the people in this church love you. Amen. And so we just got to look beyond our little circle. Are you with me? If you're getting bullied on social media, stop social media. Duh. If you don't see it, it will not trouble you. You get it. So <clears throat> there's things that we've got to do so that we can live a balanced life. So we got to, uh, Paul says, that I may know him. You see, knowing Jesus is not just knowing about his historical life. Uh, it's not just about knowing the correct doctrines regarding Jesus. And, and it's not the same as knowing his moral example. And it's not the same as knowing the great work that he's done on our behalf. You can say that you know someone because you recognize them. You can say, I know Pastor Bernie, but yes, you do know me to an extent, <clears throat> but you don't know all about me. Are you with me? Uh, wait, I know the Queen of England. I know uh, I can read and find out what she has for breakfast. I know how many dogs she's got. I know who her family is. I know what she has for afternoon tea. I know all of those, but she's never invited me. Are you with me? So I know who she is, but I really don't know her. Uh, are you with me? So uh, there's a deeper thing. We can say we, we know someone we're acquainted with. You know, it's like we get to know those public figures so well. <clears throat> like footballers or rugby players, you can tell all the statistics about these people, but you really don't know them. Are you with me? It's, it's so Paul is talking about something that is much more, it's, it's different from that. You see, we can say we know someone because we've committed our life to them. We're married to them. 47 years uh, last week, we, we celebrated our anniversary. Uh, we've known each other for 50 years, half a century. For goodness sake, what a shock. 50 years. <laughs> Do you know how long 50 years are? <laughs> Five life terms. No, only kidding, only kidding, only kidding, it was just a joke. So, but I can tell you, I still get surprised daily. You think you know someone, but there's a surprise waiting some mornings, you know, and some nights, or you, you think, wow, what a show, I thought I knew you. Uh, well, I'm telling you, it's, uh, so you think you know someone. Uh, you see, there's a way of knowing Jesus Christ that includes, listen to what Charles Haddon Spud, Spurgeon says. He was one of the greatest preachers, and I'm quoting from him. Uh, it includes all of these things, but goes beyond that. They tell me, this is Charles Haddon Spurgeon, he says, they tell me that he is a king and that he reigns over sin. He has subdued my enemies beneath his feet. I know him in that character. They tell me he is a shepherd. I know him, for I am his sheep. They say he is a door. I've entered in through him, and I know him as a door. They say he is food. My spirit feeds in him as on the bread of heaven, and therefore I know him as such. But Paul was reaching for something else. He was reaching to know him in the power of his resurrection. I believe that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is a power-filled church. It's not a, a, a pusillanimous, pussyfooting church. 
It's a power-filled church. It has power-filled people in the church. Everyone in the church that's a believer has the ability to lay hands on the sick and the sick shall recover. Amen? Everyone at praise and faith has the, 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 the promise that that prayer will come to pass. Is Anna here? Anna, would you just come up? I want Anna to share a testimony here. Anna, Anna's been uh, residing in hospital all week, so we're so glad that she's here with us today. And I need a microphone for Anna. <coughs> She's going to tell us about her brother okay. that working? we were praying. Yay, yeah, they can hear me. <laughs> Please. Thank you. So you want me to tell about the brother? Yeah. Okay. So I don't know if all of you know, but my brother was taken to the hospital, and um, he was... I even don't, know, don't have a word, but he was really bad. When doctor came, they said that his brain didn't have oxygen like for five minutes. And it means if there is no oxygen for five minutes, there is brain damage. So he was, for three days, he was in a hospital. Tell the people what happened to him. Uh, he was drunk and uh, he was really bad beaten. So, you know, so he was... Uh, and then, and then doctor think that they, he tried to do the suicide. He tried to get, kill himself, and uh, so this is why he doesn't. You, you know, the brain didn't have the oxygen because he just tried to help kill kill himself. Uh, anyway, oh, he turned into the hospital for three days. For two days, he was like. We didn't know what to do. We didn't know what to expect. Even if he wakes up, you know, we, we don't know. Does he going to remember something? He's going to be fine. He's going to be the same. Or, you know, what's going to happen? And the third day, when I was praying, I was like asking to God, when my brother wakes, he's going to tell, Mom, I remember you. So, in the third day, he's awake. And first words, he says, Mom, I remember you. Amen. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's worked because I didn't let fear in my mind and in my heart. Because as soon as I start to think, oh dear, what's going to happen? He's going to die. You know, and that's it. So don't let fear or doubt in your heart. Just, just you know, stay faithful and believe that God can do miracles in your life. So I believe this is a miracle, and hopefully it's going to be a wake-up call for him to change his life, you know. Uh, and uh, if he doesn't change, I'm going to kill him by myself. Because <laughs> he's, you know, he has a, such a big, you know, gift. He's been, like, giving a gift to receive a miracle in his life. And uh, hopefully he's going to come in December. And I'm going to teach him everything. And I need to make him believe that this was no accident. That was Jesus. That was God who healed you, you know. And, uh, and I think he's, you know, he's going to change. I do believe. And like I said, if he's not, I'm just going to kill him by myself. So, <laughs> so just, better he will. <laughs> just thank everyone for your, the prayers for this yeah, week. I do want to thank you, everyone, for my prayers that I've been taken to the hospital on Tuesday night, and I was struggling in really bad pain. So something's wrong with my liver and gallstones, but everything is fine with the baby. So I'm pregnant, if you don't know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but we do believe for a good report for my blood test, so they're going to come next Monday, hopefully. And uh, thank you everyone for prayers for my brother, thank you for prayers for myself, and you're such an amazing church, and this is awesome to be here, and to receive all the prayers that you, you know, prayed for me and my brother. Thank you so much. Amen. Let, let's everyone right now just pray, release your faith towards... Anna, and we'll just pray again for our liver and our kidneys. Amen? Yes. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you right now, Father, for the healing power of your word, Father. We thank you for the corporate anointing in this place right now, Father, as your uh, word and the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That resurrection power, Lord, 
fills Anna from the top of her head to the tips of her toes, Father, completely making her totally whole, Father, and that she will carry this baby to full term, Lord, and uh, she'll be well and the baby will be well in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We pray that for every pregnant lady in Jesus' name. Amen. Dorothy's ready to have a baby, and um, we're excited. She's, re she's been ready for a while. <laughs> she's now over ready. Amen. Isn't that a tremendous testimony? God is working. Uh, Anna and uh, Oscars are, are going to go back to Latvia and start a church there in Latvia. Um, and uh, we're just so excited about that. And she said to God, uh, he's going to, her brother's going to be serving in that church. Amen. Amen. So what is she doing? She's seeing those things that be not as though they are. She's calling those things that be not into being. Uh, into being. Amen. So that's a, a great lesson for us. So Paul was looking for the, the resurrection power of Jesus. You see, knowing Jesus know, means knowing his power. In the new life that is imparted to us now, not when we die. It's, not, it's for now. The resurrection power is for our lives now. It hurts me uh, to, to look on uh, the web and see churches closing down. Uh, one church uh, just reported over the last few weeks. But anyway, it's closing down 13 of its 13 branches with multiple thousands of people are all closing uh, because uh, the pastor didn't recognize the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, you see, Paul wanted to know, uh, Woost uh, translation of the Bible says that Paul wanted to know in an experiential way the power of Christ's resurrection. That is, he wants to experience the same power that raised Christ from the dead, surging through his own being. It's, it means that those who are connected with Jesus Christ receive the same resurrection life. Amen? It's, it's, it's a consoling and comforting power. It gives us hope. It promises that our loved ones who are dead in Christ will live with Him. It's the covenant for household salvation. That is the kind of power that is us through that resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? It's, it's the fellowship of His sufferings, Paul says, uh, knowing Jesus also means knowing the fellowship of his sufferings. We've got to know that serving Christ isn't all a bed of roses. There's some sufferings that we've got to go through. There's some things, in, but the Roman say, uh, Bible says in Romans 8, 17, it says, if we ch are children, then heirs of God and join heirs with Christ. If, you see, we all like to know that we're heirs, that we have an inheritance, but the Bible so says, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Amen? So the, the, there will be, I can't stand up here and say there won't be suffering. There will be suffering. There'll be things that you will suffer, but God says they will build character, and he says you will not be tempted beyond that which you can endure. So God will bring you through all of these things. God is bringing us through things in this nation. He's bringing us through circumstances which some of us have had tremendously uh, terrible circumstances against us in the course of this year, but you're still here. Amen? And we give glory to God. Paul says in Philippians, rejoice always. So that's the resurrection power that, that we have in him. You see, Paul was on a mission. He was uh, totally focused. He was totally uh, this one thing. It's like we have one thing. It's the, 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 they call it the hedgehog principle. The hedgehog has got one thing to do. If the enemy comes, it rolls up into a ball, gets all its spikes out so the enemy can't get it. That's all it does. Amen. I think I need to use this. 
So the hedgehog uh, does one thing, and, but does it well. We, we, we got to do, don't be proud of being a multitasker. Do one thing and do it well. Amen? I know some of us have to do different things, but we, if we break it down into bite-sized bits, that we can do one thing and do it well. And don't leave things undone. Finish that which we started. Finish that which God gave us to do. Amen? Uh, you see, if, if we uh, get to the place where we give God the glory and we take ourselves out of the picture, then you're going to have quantum leaps in faith. So Paul was on a mission. That mission was called the Great Commission. He was determined to adhere and carry out everything that God began to show him from the, from the moment that he came to know God on the road to Damascus. Paul was determined to know everything. His first question when he was thrown off that horse in Acts chapter 9 was, Who are you, Lord? And the second question is, What do you want me to do for you? It's like, when we come to know Jesus, you say, who are you? I want to know all about you. And then what do you want me to do for you? You see, a Christian that's not doing anything would be an anomaly. God wants Christians to do something for him. And, 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 and the Word of God says in Matthew 28, he says, go, make disciples of all the nations. And you say, some people say, well, I, I, I don't know what to do. I, I don't know. I don't have a vision for my life. Well, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you, and be sure of this, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So God has given every one of us a mission. It's called the Great Commission. And, and we, 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 we are to be out there redigging those wells. Those people that once knew Jesus, you go and redig the wells there. And, and it's, the Bible says in Isaiah 12 that it's with joy that we draw waters from the wells of salvation. Amen. We get joy. This church will be full of joy when we're bringing in people that don't know Jesus. Amen. You'll be full of joy. You'll be fulfilled as a Christian. You'll be happy to be a Christian. You will see your life change. You will see things in your life change continuously because you're doing what God asked you to do. Amen. Paul says, you can imagine Paul, he says, well, how will I do that? I've been a persecutor of people. I've been trained in such a way that I look down with disdain on everyone that's not a Pharisee. The, the, the Bible theologians tell us there was only about 6,000 Pharisees, and they look down on everyone else's dogs. So God is saying, well, what, how do I do that? I, 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 I'm killing these people. All of a sudden, there's a change. Jesus replied and said in Matthew 22, 37, he gave them the key. And it's our key. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. You see, God wants us to love ourselves so that we can love our neighbor. God wants us to be people that walk filled with love. You see, but how do I do that? Paul, you can imagine saying, Paul saying, look, I've been doing, but when we lived in South Africa, when we lived in Middleburg, uh, we had people coming from Rhodesia, the former Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe. These guys were fighting, every, every six weeks they were in the bush, uh, fighting or, uh, in a war and killing and everything else. And now these guys were being demobbed. The army was uh, now split up and they were being demobbed and they were landing in Middleburg where we were because that was kind of the nearest big town. And there were people there that, that couldn't adjust to normal life because they've been so used to killing. 
so used to carrying guns and, and, and shooting people and all that sort of thing that they just couldn't get used to normal life. Are you with me? Uh, to, to adjust, uh, after the Second World War and the First World War, they used to bring the soldiers home and then they would uh, help them to uh, adjust in their mind to, be, to get... And, and a lot of people that were in the wars never did adjust. They lived with the memories for the rest of their lives. They couldn't adjust to living uh, a normal life. Are you with me? So you can imagine Paul here. He's, he's been used to killing and hunting down people and going out and pulling all the Christians in. And he said, well, how do I do that? And, and the Word of God says in Romans 5.5, 5, such hope never disappoints or deludes or, or, or or shames us, for God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So the Holy Spirit's been given to us so that we can love people as we love ourselves. But we got to love ourselves first. You got to love yourself. You got to love yourself. You got to love that. You don't look in the mirror and say, my nose is too big, I've got spots, I, I, my ears are too sticky out, and you start to criticize yourself. No, you, you, you're hating on yourself when you do that. You've got to love yourself. You've got to look in the mirror and see that God's creation. You've got to look in the mirror and see the beauty the, uh, of uniqueness. Yes. Amen. Yes. You've got to see that God has made, given you a voice and has made you powerful. Yes. Amen. You, they, they say that even uh, someone who uh, is antisocial will, know ten th will, will, will have uh, touched 10,000 people in their lifetime. So you know, every one of us touched someone. So God is looking for us to get focused on this one thing. And over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be sharing some other things from Philippians. Philippians is a fantastic uh, book. It's a, it's, it's a book where Paul is exhorting the people. And I believe that we need that exhor exhortation at this time, that we would rise up and be the people that God called us to be. Amen. We don't need to be caught up in the things of this world and the things of the flesh, but be caught up in the things of God. Learn to love yourself. Learn not to say negative things about yourself. Learn not to say fearful things over your life that brings you into a place of fear. If you know, I hear it all the time. If, if, if they shut this place down, I'll be the first to go and, and all that sort of thing, you know. And uh, if, if we're going on holiday, I'll probably be sick before I go and I'll not be able to go and all these negative things that we say. If, uh, if, if we Johnny's out there in the swing, he's going to fall off and break his leg and all that sort of thing. It's all negative talk. You need to talk life over your family. You need to talk life over your life. You need to speak the things that God says over your life. Amen. I believe that we're a growing church. The vision God gave us was to come back here and teach a message of faith, hope, 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 and love so that we would build a nation of people that are filled with hope, people that enjoy their Christianity, people that know how to laugh and rejoice and the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Would you close your eyes and bow your head with me right now? Thanks for listening. Remember to visit our website, www.bridge-church.com and connect with us via Facebook and Twitter.